kind of derailed us. So he's agreed to do a virtual talk for us. So I think that'll be good, but we'll get to tonight's speaker. Um, it's our very own DAX board member, Jim Eccles. He's a historian and retired public affairs specialist at White Sands Missile Range, where he spent a career of about 30 years there and he's become an expert on the Trinity site. So what better person to present uh, Trinity at 75, myths, misinformation, and things you probably don't know. Jim, go ahead. Thank you, Garland. Okay, well, Trinity site is 75 years old this year. The first explosion or the test took place on July 16th, 1945. So it's been around for 75 years and that's plenty of time for myths and misinformation to grow up around it. And also the winnowing of facts. Uh, we're, we're getting rid of the detail as we go down the road, so to speak. And so you'll see the focus now on just the big rock stars of the science, Oppenheimer and Groves, and you miss all the other people that were involved in it. And I'm going to try to bring some of that out, try to uh, smash some of the myths, uh, whack them like I, you would whack a mole in that game, whack-a-mole, and go on from there. And so, and I, and present some of the information I think that's kind of interesting, like this picture of uh, the explosion. It's about two seconds after detonation, and you never see this picture used because it's kind of mushy, and what are those two things up there in the, above the fireball, those two puffs and those lines coming down? Uh, most people look at that and go, oh, gee whiz, what's that? And some people say, well, they're UFOs being incinerated by the explosion that they were there to nose around. Uh, but of course, that's not the case. And uh, usually what you get, let me see if I can make this slide go next. You see these pictures of uh, the explosion. The one on the left is the, the mushroom cloud at about 15 seconds. And uh, the one on the right is the fireball at 25 milliseconds or 25 thousandths of a second. So it's just forming. But, uh, and something about these photos that uh, brings me to one of the myths. And you can see around the, the fireball and the mushroom cloud that it is black, it is dark. That's because the explosion took place at 5.30 a.m. Mountain War time, which is daylight savings time, and it was very dark. And so everything around the, in the background and whatnot is in the black. Nowadays, though, you'll see people putting up uh, mushroom cloud photos in, that are taken in broad daylight, and they'll tell you that that's the Trinity site explosion. In fact, this uh, last summer, White Sands Missile Range put together some souvenirs to commemorate the 75th anniversary. And they were using images that were not the Trinity site image. Uh, I don't know where they got them, but they were not correct. Interestingly, the picture on the right with the ball, the plasma bubble there, there's a red arrow and there's a line uh, on the right side. That line corresponds to these lines on the first slide that come down. So what is that all about? Well, those are barrage balloons that were anchored to the west of the tower at ground zero. And the idea was to hang instrumentation from those barrage balloons, trying to collect data on the very first moments of the chain reaction that takes place in a nuclear explosion. And uh, Robert Wilson's group, the guy you've never heard of, was in charge of trying to collect this data and it's during the first 10 nanoseconds. Now, I had to look that up. A nanosecond is a billionth of a second. So we're talking about the first 10 billionth of a second. And I usually, when I talk, I try to compare pair time and things like that to real life things. You know, you talk about the blink of an eye or a heartbeat or something. Well, those things just don't <laughs> do nanoseconds justice. So the trick is to try to collect some data on the chain reaction as it starts and then collect that and record it somehow. And the balloons were one of those attempts. So uh, this explosion at two to three seconds has already the radiation and heat has incinerated these balloons and the steel cables are turning to smoke. 
because they are being vaporized in the explosion. It's pretty incredible stuff. Now, you might say, well, what's this guy, just because he's worked at White Sands for 30 years, and what's he got to know about Trinity Site, other than he's been there a lot of times? I'll bet you I am the only person that's going to ever talk to you about Trinity Site, uh, who's ever written about Trinity Site, who has appeared in Playboy magazine at Trinity Site. So I got a, uh, I did a tour, I guess you'd call it, back in 1980 of a photo for a photojournalist from Japan representing Playboy magazine. And I took him out to the site, spent the day out there, and he took a picture of me and you can see it on the right. Those are pictures that he took at Trinity site. And that's me opening the gate to ground zero. After the magazine was published, he uh, sent me a copy of the magazine. And we had a, a gentleman at White Sands who did speak Japanese and was able to translate the article for us. Uh, and I can tell you that this magazine got passed around to a lot of offices and is very dog-eared. I still have the copy. So let's talk a little bit about White Sands Missile Range, which is where Trinity Site is located. White Sands is a large military test installation, 3,200 square miles. It's as big as Delaware and Rhode Island put together. At the north end is Trinity Site, a National Historic Landmark, where the first atomic bomb was exploded. And most people say that's where the atomic age started. Down at the south end is another National Historic Landmark. It's Launch Complex 32, 33, where the V-2 rockets, the German V-2s were launched. And it's usually credited as where the space age began for the United States. Kind of interesting that there are two National Historic Landmarks on this fairly modern uh, piece of military property that uh, are not related to the Civil War, the Revolutionary War, or something like that. So one of my first myths is the White Sands National Monument. Uh, in my job at White Sands, for a while I was collecting ethereal materials about the missile range, ads, paper ads, and magazines, and things like that and uh, relating to the 40s and 50s. So for example, I was able on eBay to pick up this Osmobile ad that appeared in Life magazine. And remember the, the Rocket 88, the Osmobile Rocket 88? It had badges on it that were rockets. Uh, they talked about the rocket engine that uh, was in it. It was an attempt by many uh, companies uh, to associate themselves with cutting edge technology to make the customer uh, appreciate what they'd done to develop this new technology. And of course we do it today with uh, everything's digital these days. You have to equate whatever your product is to some digital product or development. So I would sometimes in the search put in just white sands and I came up with postcards at one point and uh, there was a White Sands National Monument postcard, a nice color one for sale. And I read the description from the seller and he said that this is a 1950s postcard, et cetera, et cetera. And that the sand was bleached white by the explosion or test at Trinity site. Now, some myths are kind of believable and some are just so ludicrous they don't get ever any traction. This is one that I've never seen repeated anywhere, thank God. So why was there a Trinity site? Well, the people at Los Alamos came up with two bomb designs. The one out here on the left is a little boy. It used uranium-235. It's very simple. It simply shot a red lump of uranium down into the another red lump of uranium on a, in a cannon tube and you get a critical mass chain reaction kaboom. Uh, the other bomb was fat man and it used plutonium and initially they were going to use the uh, little boy design for plutonium found out that wouldn't work. And so they came up with a totally different design on getting a critical mass for the plutonium. And it involved creating a ball or sphere of plutonium about the size of that softball I'm holding in my hand in that center photo. That's a youth softball. And according to Coster Mullins calculations, it's within a tenth of an inch or so of the actual plutonium core size. 
Then they surrounded that plutonium core with 5,000 pounds of high explosives in 32 individual chunks. And the trick was to get each one of those individual pieces to all go off at the same time. So that you compress that softball down to something the size of a golf ball, get critical mass, kaboom. That was pretty uncertain that they could make that happen back in 1945. And so they decided they needed to test it. And out of that came Trinity site. Let's go next to Trinity site itself. A, on the bottom photo, you have a 100 foot steel tower on which the bomb was placed for the explosion, for the test. And you see those black lines coming out of the top of the tower. That's related to Robert Wilson's attempt to uh, collect data during the first 10 nanoseconds of the explosion. Those are big coaxial cables uh, running from instrumentation up in there and trying to collect a signal down in a bunker off to the north. And the top photo is the bomb itself without the casing on top of that tower. That's Norris Bradbury there standing in the, uh, beside the bomb. He was the uh, successor to Robert Oppenheimer at Los Alamos as manager. So the selection of Trinity site has bred a myth that has gotten a lot of traction. And I think it's gotten a lot of traction because it involves these two guys, two very important World War II figures, George Patton and Leslie Groves. Leslie Groves, of course, you know who George Patton is, but Leslie Groves is head of the Manhattan Project in charge of Los Alamos and Hanford and Oak Ridge and the whole kit and caboodle putting it together. So in 1944, when the Manhattan Project and Los Alamos people more specifically started to look around for a place to test uh, that fat man bomb uh, technology, they looked at different places around the Southwest. Uh, they looked at the sand dunes up in Colorado. They looked at the lava flows out near Grants and Gallup, New Mexico. They looked at an island off the coast of California near LA. Uh, they looked at uh, the Desert Training Center, which is near Rice, California, in the deserts of California, and also the sand dunes or the sandbars off the coast of Texas, and uh, the, a couple of sites on the old Alamogordo bombing range, which is what's now the missile range. Now, the story is that General Groves, and I, I got to tell you the origin of the story, this appeared, this uh, version of the story appeared in 1984 when Professor Size published his book, uh, The Day the Sun Rose Twice. And it's based on a 1982 interview with a guy named Henderson, 40 years, almost 40 years after the test, after the selection of the site. And in this story, uh, General Groves rejects using the training center in California because he says it belongs to George Patton and he doesn't want to have anything to do with asking George Patton to use the land for the test and therefore it was taken off the table. And so some of us have been looking around going well that's kind of weird since George Patton wasn't anywhere near this when uh, 1945 was going on. And when you look at George Patton's timeline, he was at the Desert Training Center, yes. In the summer of 1942, he helped establish it. He was in charge of it because he was training his camp, his tank crews to go to Africa and fight Rommel and the Germans. They left in September of 1942. And of course, Patton is over there. And after Patton is done there in North Africa, he's in charge of the invasion of Sicily. And after that, he goes to England and he's in charge of the decoy army in Northern England that's trying to fool the Germans into thinking the invasion on D-Day is gonna be further North. And then of course, D-Day happens in 1944 and George is in charge of an army heading for Germany. So it's been almost two years since he had anything to do with the Desert Training Center. Now, Leslie Groves was a career army guy and he was smart. Uh, he was in charge of building the Pentagon and he's in charge of building the first atomic bombs. He knows what's going on. 
to say that he would be that dumb to not know that Patton had nothing to do with the uh, Desert Training Center, I think is just crazy. I think we've got an example of somebody that probably didn't like Groves and there were a lot of people like that because he was gruff and pushy and demanding uh, that just grabbed this story, maybe exagger exaggerated another story. I'm not sure, but uh, it just doesn't hold any water. So why is the site called Trinity? That's probably the most common question we get out at the site during open houses. Trinity site is open to the public twice a year, first Saturday in April, first Saturday in October. Groves, General Groves wanted to know that as well. And he wrote to Oppenheimer and said, why did you name the site Trinity? And Oppenheimer responded saying that he didn't really recall exactly, but when he was asked for a, a name, he was reading, uh, some John Donne poetry, and what popped into his mind was a John Donne uh, a devotional poem, which the first line reads, batter my heart, three-faced God. And so he said, let's call it Trinity. The, the thing that's interesting about this is that because he was kind of vague about it, it left the door open for speculation. Now, I don't know if you've looked at the uh, the reading list for Trinity Site Manhattan Project Los Alamos, but it's a huge list of books that have been published in the last four decades. And so every guy that writes a new book, and I know I wrote one, uh, you got to be different than the people before you. You got to have something new. So writers have taken advantage of this uncertainty. And now when you pick up a book that talks about Trinity site and why it's Trinity, there will be pages devoted to speculating that Oppenheimer really meant American uh, or Native Americans, something about their religions. Uh, he'll talk about the Far East religions and philosophies because he was into that. Uh, of course, there are the relationships with Christian religions and stuff. I mean, it goes on and on and on, kind of silly. In my office, Public Affairs, we started seeing that. And uh, we said, you know, really, Trinity site is the culmination of the work, the effort, the science, the technology developed at Hanford, where they uh, did the uranium separation, Oak Ridge, or Oak Ridge, I'm sorry, is where they did that. Hanford is where they did, had the reactors to uh, create the plutonium. And Los Alamos, they were in charge of designing and actually building a bomb. That's a trio, a triad, a trinity. And, you know, it's interesting. I've been telling visitors this little clip or uh, story for quite a few years and they usually start nodding their heads and they go, well, that makes sense. I like that. Of course, then we have to tell them that we're just blowing smoke, that uh, there's nothing close to reality about it, but uh, it does make a lot of sense. <laughs> Let's see, what do we got next? Okay. Some stories, although they seem really weird, are absolutely true. Back in 2000, I got a call from Polo Magazine, Player's Edition. First of all, who knew that there was a Polo Magazine? I mean, is that something that's available down at uh, Barnes & Noble? I kind of doubt it. Anyway, the magazine editors had heard that uh, soldiers at Trinity site at base camp uh, played Polo. And I said, they absolutely did. And uh, they said, uh, can we get information and stuff? And I said, sure, I'll send it to you. So there are two pictures of the guys playing polo. Uh, the, the military police at base camp, the guys in charge of security at Trinity site were a mounted unit out of Los Alamos. So they brought their horses with them. Turns out they didn't really need the horses much for doing the security work. Jeeps and trucks were a lot faster and easier. And plus it was hotter and blazes in the summertime. So uh, Lieutenant Bush, who was in charge of security, uh, he really looked after his men. He tried to do as much as he could for them. He had connections places back east and he got polo equipment for them. I mean, the, the helmets, you can see they're wearing the helmets, but the polo mallets and the little wooden balls and stuff. So the military police went out and tried to play polo, but with those mallets and the wooden balls and that soft sand, it just wasn't working. So these guys being, you know, they're creative folks, ingenious. Uh, they took brooms and you can see uh, 
they cut the whisk off the ends of these brooms and then they used a volleyball and you can see a volleyball under this guy's arm here in the bottom picture and so they were able to play polo doing that so I sent the pictures and a little background to Polo Magazine. They sent me a copy of the magazine. And it was great. It was a full page article, except for the first sentence in the article. And you can read it up above. It says, about 40 miles outside of San Antonio, Texas, the United States had a blah, blah, blah. Some editor in Florida or somewhere must have decided that San Antonio was really in Texas and not New Mexico. So here's a picture of uh, Lieutenant Bush on his horse. He called it honesty. He's one of my favorite guys out at White Sands because he looked out for his men. Uh, he thought for himself and he was just interesting. This is a picture above him of the South 10,000 yard bunker. The picture I showed you on the front slide is those pictures are taken from the North 10,000 yard bunker. There were manned bunkers at the south, west, and north points. The north and west points were mainly for photography. And most of the pictures that you see uh, published in the books and the magazines, etc., are taken from the north by Berlin Brixner. And I'll show you a picture of Berlin a little later because I got to interview him. Uh, south bunker was the control bunker. And you can see all the wiring coming out of the bunker, leaving behind it, and then headed up into the test bed. And all that wiring is attached to a uh, very, uh, uh, what do I want to say, uh, deliberate and, uh, well, detailed. Uh, timing device. Not only did it trigger the bomb, but it triggered the seismographs, the cameras. There were over 50 cameras that had to be turned on. Everything had to be turned on at the right time, up to a fraction of a second, to make sure they got it all. So Bush was at South 10,000 with Oppenheimer and a few of the other guys, and Bush decided not to be in the bunker. And at 10,000 yards, five and a half miles, he thought he was going to be okay. So he stood beside the bunker and everybody was, that was outside at base camp and other places was told to look away from the explosion. Most of them were told to lay on the ground. Bush did not. He got down the crouch, put his hands over his head and was looking away, had his eyes shut and he could hear the countdown on a loudspeaker system here at South 10,000. And he said that all of a sudden, it just lit up. It was just blindingly bright. And he said in his report that he touched his eyelids with his finger to make sure that his eyes were actually shut. It was that bright. And then after a couple of seconds, of course, it starts to dim. He stood up and faced towards ground zero. And about that time, the shockwave came along and knocked him flat on his butt. Uh, he was not harmed or anything, but uh, it was interesting. There were other people as well who chose to be outside. One of the stories that we hear a lot of, and it gets written up, and, uh, and I think it gets written up because of the drama it adds to the situation. Uh, there's a lot of effort, especially with TV people, to add drama to the test. And one of those is this weather idea the idea that there's lightning striking everywhere, that's raining cats and dogs, and, uh, and it influenced the test. It did influence the test. The test was scheduled for 4 a.m. on July 16th, but there were thunderstorms. It's the monsoon season, and uh, they were coming off the mountains to the west and drifting over the uh, Jornada del Morto. And uh, so you, you hear these stories, and in the movies, they've made it look like it was really raining. So I started asking the guys I got to meet that were actually at, this, at the test. I said, well, were you laying in mud then uh, during the test, looking away? And they said, no, it wasn't muddy. And so I'm going, I don't, I wonder how much it really rained. And I found over the years some written accounts. Stanley Hall, for instance, wrote a memoir for his family. And he actually poo-poos the rain idea. He uh, says that the descriptions of rain are a little overblown and that all he remembered at base camp 10 miles away was an occasional drizzle. William Lawrence, the only reporter 
at the event, the only reporter inside the Manhattan Project it was the New York Times guy. And he was at Campania Hill, about 20 miles north, and he wrote about a light drizzle as well and some cloud to cloud lightning. Richard Watts was at South 10,000 with Bush and Oppenheimer and those guys. And he remembered uh, some small puddles on the asphalt. So I think probably what happened is that late in the night, these storms, as they come off, they lose energy, they lose their wind, they tend to have light showers and drizzle, and that's probably what happened. They rescheduled the explosion for 5.30 a.m., and that's when it was uh, set off. Now, the site is a little radioactive uh, yet, and that's why the on the top left photo, you see this outer fence, and there is a cautionary sign there. Nobody considers the radiation levels particularly dangerous, but because they are higher than background radiation for southern New Mexico, the Army is required to put up the signs. And most people, uh, once they hear the comparisons, and I'll show you those in a minute, they go, okay, that's no big deal. Uh, but there are individuals uh, who will take exception to that. One year after an open house, after everybody left the parking lot, we found a pile of shoes. And we're going, well, how does somebody drive off and leave three pairs of shoes behind? We decided that uh, they were probably a little paranoid about taking home some quote unquote radioactive dust with them and left their shoes behind. The bottom picture shows ground zero at Trinity site. Uh, the dark obelisk there, the pointy thing is sitting at exact ground zero between the what would have been the four legs to the tower. The silver uh, rectangle is the, uh, I guess I got a pointer here, is a shelter protecting an original portion of the crater floor. The fence is purely arbitrary to keep the visitors in under control during their visit so they don't wander all over the place. And we get about 3,000 visitors each open house. It is amazing. They just keep coming and coming. So radiation levels there at ground zero are about one half of a millirem per hour. Now, that probably doesn't mean much to most of you, but uh, when you put it in perspective with your other exposures to radiation, it's pretty meaningless, uh, your hour at ground zero. And then handily, it's pretty much the same exposure you receive in a jet airliner flying at 35,000 feet uh, from the cosmic radiation, you're getting about a half a millirem per hour. So uh, a trip from El Paso to New York will give you more radiation exposure than an hour or two at Trinity site. So we get to radiation from all kinds of sources and we're probably getting 300 or so millirem per year as Americans. And uh, the atmosphere above us filters out a lot of that. If it wasn't for the atmosphere, we'd be fried. So you can see that top uh, line at sea level, you get 24 millirem per year. At Denver, a mile higher, you get 50 millirem, it's doubled. So again, the atmosphere is a great filter for that, but we get a radiation from eating, uh, chest x-rays. If you're a smoker, you get a lot. And a big dose comes from radon gas that gets trapped in your house. If you've got a basement, and you don't get uh, much cir air circulation, you might wanna have it checked. There are kits that you can get to uh, check the levels. So one of the legends, it's, it's just misinformation, mistaken information. This house is two miles from ground zero and uh, is where the plutonium core that little uh, ball was first assembled. It came down from Los Alamos as two hemispheres. And it was assembled in this room here, which was the master bedroom. And we always knew it as the McDonald Ranch House. They were the last owners. George McDonald and his wife were the last owners before the army took over the property. And uh, so the building was restored in 1984-85 by the army and to its 1945 condition. And we did a lot of work on it. It got a lot of publicity. And uh, we got a letter from Frances Schmidt, the lady down here at the right, 
Uh, actually, it was she was dictated it to her daughter who hand wrote the letter saying that her father, Franz Schmidt, built that house in 1913. And she gave us all kinds of great detail, the color of the rooms in the house, what they were painted, uh, where the stoves were, uh, all this stuff, how she watered plants here between the wall and the house. And the rest of the land around there, you couldn't have plants because the livestock would come and eat it. Um, but uh, the picture to the left or in the middle here of the young girl, that's Frances as a young girl when she was living in the house. So we've gone to calling it the Schmidt McDonald Ranch House uh, and tried to correct that oversight because the Schmidt's actually built it. The gentleman standing at the entrance to the house there is Jim Konetka. Jim is a friend and he's the author of a couple of books uh, on Los Alamos or the, the Manhattan Project. One is uh, Los Alamos City of Fire or something like that. And the other is The General and the Genius about Groves and Oppenheimer, both good books. So this is Jack Aby, photographer at the explosion. And this is the picture that made him famous. This is the only color picture of the Trinity site test. This is another problem where we've got uh, pictures of other tests that are being passed off as Trinity site tests. You'll see color images of other tests passed off as the Trinity test. This is the only one. And if it doesn't look like this, it may be cleaned up a little bit, but if it doesn't look like this, it's uh, not the right, uh, the right photo. Jack was given a strip of color film and he put it in his camera and he sat on a chair outside of base camp 10 miles from ground zero and clicked off a few shots and this is the one that came in, um, came out. Uh, one of the problems we've had with this is that uh, people have cleaned up this image, gotten rid of the dust spots and the smudges and things like that. And they've seen the pictures uh, that Los Alamos puts out, like this one down below on the left, with that rooster tail coming out there to the right. And they see that rooster tail coming out to the left on Jack's picture. And so they go, well, Jack's photo should look like the others, they think, because they don't know the background. And so they flip this image. And so the color image matches the stuff, the black and white images from North 10,000. And Jack complained bitterly about it. I interviewed him at Trinity site. And he said, oh, they, they don't believe him or they won't change it and stuff like that. So I've kind of taken up the cause <laughs> to make sure that we've got the the orientation right because Jack at South or at base camp was 180 degrees opposite of Berlin Brixner. So the rooster tail would be going one way in Jack's frame and the other way in Berlin. So anyway, uh, that is again, the only color image. And usually what you'll see though, are the black and whites, this one. This is Berlin Brixner. I'm interviewing him at ground zero and he was at North 10,000 and there were color uh, or cameras loaded with color film, but none of the images came out. And so what you'll see are the black and white images. And most all of those were taken with a, a couple of Mitchell 35 millimeter cameras, one with a tele, big telephoto lens and one using a 75 millimeter lens. Let's see. Now, this is a little bit of trivia. Again, I said things you probably didn't know. Uh, this is base camp, 10 miles from ground zero, and you can see barracks buildings and hutments. This is a ranch, one of the original ranch buildings. This belonged to Dave McDonald, the brother to George McDonald. And uh, there is a, a booklet, a paperback book uh, about uh, base camp and living out at uh, base camp. And in it, they have a map of these buildings and stuff. And the cut line says that these buildings are aligned on the uh, cardinal north and south points. Well, I was out here uh, at the site uh, a couple of years ago, and I've been and walked these grounds many times. And the foundations for a number of these barracks buildings are still there. The buildings, all the buildings are all gone except for the ranch structures. And I was looking up the uh, back of the, the uh, uh, foundation up towards ground zero, and I'm going, these things are lined up straight at ground zero. So when I got home, I uh, 
called up Google Earth and uh, drew a line from ground zero down through base camp. And lo and behold, yes, these buildings are lined up exactly aimed at ground zero. And they are about 15 to 20 degrees off of straight north. So what these guys did was they lined the buildings up with the smallest face, smallest area possible facing ground zero where the shock wave the air blast was going to come from. They knew that if they had this wide structure facing the building, they might have damage or destruction of the structures. And I do that and I talk about this just to bring out the fact that these guys thought of a lot of detail. They were really prepared. Uh, they knew that there was going to be that flash of light and everybody had welder's goggles or a piece of welder's glass taped into a piece of cardboard and base camp and the bunkers and everywhere else so that they didn't damage their eyes from the explosion. You'll see this again when people talk about Trinity site, again, trying to build drama and suspense. They'll talk about these guys not knowing what they were doing, not knowing what was going to happen. And it's true, there were some things that were very uncertain, but they had thought of a lot of detail and had prepared for a lot of it to the point of preparing teams in some of the communities to evacuate them in case the radiation levels got too high. Uh, this is a thing, a uh, little, uh, I guess a story, kind of a myth that's uh, had been reported to me a couple of times at Trinity site open houses. This is Jumbo, the huge steel container. It weighs two, weighed 214 tons. It was manufactured in Ohio and was taken to Trinity site. And the idea was to explode the bomb inside of this container. And in case it was a failure, a fizzle, the container was designed to withstand the explosion of the 5,000 pounds of high explosives, but prevent it from blowing the plutonium all over the countryside. By the time Jumbo era arrived at Pope siding, got unloaded and everything and taken to ground zero, they, they had decided not to use it. And so it just stood 800 yards from ground zero and wasn't used. The, the story comes in is people have come to me and said, Pope siding, why is it called Pope? Is it because that Enrico Fermi, the Nobel Prize winner, Italian Nobel Prize winner, was working at Los Alamos and somebody got the idea that because he's an Italian, he's probably a Catholic and so they called the sighting Pope sighting? I always scoffed at the idea. I thought, well, that's a little far-fetched. And then over the years, I started running into evidence that uh, I was right, <laughs> thank goodness. Here's a map down in the center from 1891 from King's Handbook of the United States showing the railroad coming down through the, the valley or up on the Hornada del Muerto down to Hatch. And there are the, uh, the uh, names, Pope, Lava, Crocker, Engel, etc. And in 1919, Eugene Manlove Rhodes, our uh, New Mexico author, who wrote many of Western story and novel, wrote a story for Saturday Evening Post called no, Me no Mean City. In the introduction to that, he talks about building this railroad. And he says that most of those sightings are named after railroad employees, a lot of the engineers. And somebody confirmed that decades ago by talking to the railroad. And this, this picture has no myth associated with it unless you want to make up one. I had to throw in this picture because of Oppenheimer here on the left and Ernst Lawrence on the right. They were friends. Lawrence, of course, ends up winning the uh, Nobel Prize. When, you, when I talk do talks about Oppenheimer, uh, everybody he ends up talking to or meeting seems to be a Nobel Prize winner. But I threw this picture in because doesn't Oppenheimer look like young Bob Dylan? Shouldn't, they, shouldn't he have a guitar around his neck or uh, hanging from his shoulder and that little harmonica around his neck so he could uh, sing Lay, Lady, Lay? Now, sometimes you hear information wrong, hear a briefing wrong or mistake what's being said. This is me introduce, or interviewing Fred Bach at... Uh, at Tr Trinity Site Ground Zero. He was the pilot for the great artiste uh, on the Nagasaki bombing raid. When I first learned about Trinity Site and, the, and what followed in Japan and stuff, 
1979 or 77 is when I started hearing the stories. Uh, the deal was that everybody knows the Enola Gay was the airplane used and piloted by Tibbets to drop the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima on August 6th. And then people would tell me, well, for the Nagasaki run on August 9, boxcar uh, piloted by Charles Sweeney was the airplane used. And to my ear and envisioning a B-29, which is this huge new airplane capable of delivering a freight car of uh, uh, bombs on a target, I was thinking they were saying B-O-X-C-A-R, boxcar. Well, it turns out, of course, I was all wet and uh, the airplane was named after Fred Bach, who was the pilot for it, thus Box Car, B O C K S C A R. Um, Sweeney was uh, scheduled to fly the mission, but his plane, the Great Artiste, was not modified in time. So they traded crews and, and airplanes. So Bach flew the Great Artiste as an observation plane, and Sweeney flew Box Car carrying the uh, Fat Man atomic bomb at uh, Nagasaki. At Trinity site, there's glass that was formed. It's called Trinitite. I'm holding a, not necessarily a typical piece, but a nice green piece. A lot of it's more of a gray color. And uh, this is a myth that we in public affairs in Los Alamos and other people repeated for several decades. And that was that the fireball above the, of the ground, as shown in my first slide, was hot enough at thousands of degree, degrees Fahrenheit to melt the surface of the crater, the sand, and turn it to this glass. And uh, well, okay, that makes sense. Gee whiz, I guess. So it turns out we were all wet there too. A guy, two guys by the name of Rob Hermes and Bill Strickfadden asked the missile range for some sand at Tr uh, Trinity site and some ant sand. And we sent it up to them. They were gonna do an analysis of uh, the radioactive materials at ground zero. And uh, first of all, they did a quick uh, back of envelope uh, kind of calculation and found out that probably the fireball wasn't in contact with the ground long enough to create glass, this Trinitite, half an inch thick in some cases. Boy, oh boy, that's unusual. And then they found in the ant sand, these spheres. I'm pointing at some of these spheres, balls, and they're only two millimeters big. I mean, they're tiny, and these dumbbells. And by the way, these two pictures are identical. Identical uh, pieces of Trinitite. This top one is lit from the, the light down onto the surface and reflected back, like over your shoulder. This bottom picture is the light coming up through the glass, and you can see how luminous the glass is, how transparent it is on some of these pieces. So they found these perfect spheres, and they're going, well, how does a fireball above the ground explain that? And they decided they needed a different mechanism to explain the Trinitite on the ground. And they came up with, sand and steel up into the fireball, turning to gas in many cases, and then coming back to a liquid so that you had a mist of liquid rock and steel mixing together up there. And that mist, the little tiny droplets, it becomes raindrop physics. They start bumping up against each other and they start getting heavier and they start falling out of the cloud. Some of them cool before they hit the ground and they become balls of Trinitite. They keep their shape and they're uh, in the sand uh, in the crater area. And some of it, a lot of it comes down as liquid rain in pools and covers most of the surface of the crater. And the continuing heat from above gives it a real nice smooth surface. So that piece I'm holding, uh, that's the top of it. And you can see how nice and smooth it is. You can see some bubbles that were probably formed in it there that uh, exploded. This is the backside of a piece of Trinitite, a very rare red Trinitite. And it's red because of copper. The green color of the, uh, the glass is from iron. Of course, we got a steel tower that got incinerated, uh, vaporized in the explosion. So it's part of the glass. 
Uh, but there's also copper, those big coaxial cables coming off the north side of the tower. All that copper went up. And in fact, the places we found this red trinitite is in the vicinity of where those coaxial cables uh, went down and went into the ground. Um, so uh, there's some of this on display at Los Alamos. And then we have, uh, during the open houses, we bring trinitite for people to see. It's still there in the ground as well. People are always picking up shards of it. By the numbers, the plutonium at Trinity site, uh, the diameter of that core was about 3.6 inches. It weighed 13 and a half pounds. That's all there was there. That produced the equivalent of 42 million pounds of TNT. And that was only having 20% of it fission or go through a chain reaction and give up its energy. In other words, 2.7 pounds is what gave us 42 million pounds of uh, equivalent TNT explosion. So here's my favorite Trinity story. And it starts with this guy up here, Mark, uh, what is his name, Harp. Uh, years ago, we got a package in my office, uh, early 90s, filled with these kind of letters and stuff um, from heads of state and whatnot, uh, thanking Mr. Harp for his interesting um, <laughs> theory. And gee whiz, they would pass it on to somebody. Harp's theory is uh, that the earth is actually hollow and that there are humanoid uh, creatures living down there and that there are holes uh, exiting to the outside of the earth, one at the North Pole, one at the South Pole. And that our governments all know about this and they keep us in the dark so that we don't worry about it, blah, blah, blah. It's typical nonsense, but it's kind of fun. And uh, he says that in 1945 on July 16th, when the first atomic bomb was exploded, not only did it shake much of New Mexico, it shaked the, uh, shook the inner earth where these humanoids were uh, living. And uh, they wondered what it was. So they built themselves a flying machine of some sort. And it took a year or two. And so in 1947, they flew up out of the North Pole hole and flew down towards Trinity site to investigate. And lo and behold, their flying machine malfunctioned and they missed Trinity site and crashed off to the east near Roswell and on the ranch there. And so one of the ranches, and so the UFO debris for the Roswell incident really comes from inner space and not outer space. Um, I think the guy saw Superman in the moment. I don't know if, if any of you remember this. I'm old enough to have watched Superman on TV and the mole men, which was a two parter, uh, which they made into a movie, a little movie release where these uh, mole creatures came out of the center of the earth uh, because of a deep oil well. So I think they took that story and modified it uh, for the Trinity thing. So that's it. If I didn't answer questions you might have, uh, you might look for my book. Uh, it's available in Las Cruces. It, COAs and uh, out at the Mesilla Book Center and of course on Amazon and uh, we'll try to answer questions now and uh, if you've sent something in by chat or whatever we'll try to do that. By the way this statue is up at Los Alamos, Oppenheimer and Groves and it's just south of the lodge up there which is uh, one of the historical buildings and also uh, on uh, October 13th, I'm going to give a talk on Victoria Peak, 100 tons of gold or 100 tall tails. That's being done through the Las Cruces Railroad Muse Museum from noon until 1 p.m. So with that, let's see if anybody's got any questions. Dennis, or do we have anything you think? I don't see anything in the chat, Jim. So I guess if, if someone has a question, go ahead and unmute yourself and you can just ask the question. You can turn your camera on as well if you feel like it. I have one. Shoot. How, how do you get hold of the Zoom link for your railroad museum talk? 
Well, uh, the Railroad Museum will publish that and it's going to be available in their publicity and um, I will put it on my uh, own Facebook page as well. And I'll probably go ahead and use the Historical Society's uh, newsletter and put it in there if I get it in oh, time. Really? time. Does that help? Yes. Okay. If, if it's in, if it's in your new in DHS newsletter, I'll get it. Otherwise, okay. Well, thanks a lot. Okay, you're welcome. I have a question too. Uh, you may have said this, but I didn't catch it. How big is was the depression that was made, and um, what happened to the site immediately? You know, I mean, after for the several years after before it became an official place okay. to visit. Okay, the uh, because the bomb was exploded on top of a 100 foot tower. That 100 feet of air is amazing. The crater, if it'd been on the ground, would have been probably well over 100 feet deep, maybe 200, and several hundred feet wide. It would have been huge. But that 100 feet made all the difference. So what you have is more of a plate-like depression that goes out for a few hundred yards in all directions. But there in the center was a gouged out area of uh, six to 10 feet of sand that ended up being sucked up into the fireball. And that with the steel and the steel tower is what became the Trinitite, the glass, then the rain down. And of course, some of it went downwind and became fallout as well. Some of it became ash and got uh, pushed way up into the upper atmosphere and went downwind. Now that layer of trinitite on the crater uh, was analyzed for a long time. It was, uh, Los Alamos took samples of it. Uh, a lot of it was stolen by various people that snuck in there. Uh, we know of one guy that actually shoveled it into the back of his pickup truck and took it up to Santa Fe and they sold it as souvenirs. Um, but most of it was still there. And finally, in 1952, when the Manhattan Project, which was controlled by that point by the Atomic Energy Commission, uh, decided to turn that little chunk of land over to White Sands Missile Range, uh, they decided to, quote unquote, clean up the site. And they filled in some bunkers and whatnot, and they graded. They graded up the Trinitite and mixed it with sand and filled in the crater area, flattened it out, and that kind of thing. Los Alamos objected vehemently uh, because they were going to lose any future science they were going to be able to glean from uh, the glass and the crater there. Uh, but there's a, I read a, uh, a letter from a AEC lawyer or manager who said the decision was a legal medical decision and by God, they were going to bulldoze it. So uh, they were worried about getting sued sometime in the future for any kind of a medical issue. So they did it. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Hey, Jim, we have a question on chat uh, from an iPad user. It says, why is Alamogordo the atomic city when Socorro is closer? Uh, when the uh, bomb, and this is another example of being prepared, uh, being ready for the test. Uh, they didn't know how big the explosion was actually going to be. They knew people would probably notice it because of that flash of light and also the shock wave. So they prepared a number of news releases uh, and they were based on various levels of the explosion, how big it was and what kind of damage it might cause. And so those were all prepared, ready to go, waiting for the test. And then also the test took place on the north end of what was then the Alamogordo bombing range. So it made sense to everybody to have the expl explanation be that a ammo dump and a munitions dump or whatever uh, had exploded accidentally on the northern end of the bombing range. And so the release came out of the bombing range, of course, headquarters at Alamogordo at what's now Holloman Air Force Base. So that's the tag or the byline on the news release. And so, of course, people back east and anywhere out of New Mexico, they have no idea of where any of this is. And so it became the story for decades that it was uh, Alamogordo and has nothing to do with Socorro, although Socorro is the closest uh, large community. Okay. 
I've got one more question out of chat here from Dylan McDonald. It says, uh, during your time at White Sands Missile Range, did you have anyone ever come forward with claims of cancer caused by the Trinity test? Uh, at, not at the missile range. Uh, although I, I did, I remember having, uh, receiving a, a letter from someone who claimed their husband worked in the fire department and he had to go up range occasionally and come back and he, di he died of cancer. And she blamed it on the uh, Trinity site. Of course, this was years after Trinity site. Uh, so there was probably no relationship whatsoever. However, there is a downwinder group uh, working right now here in New Mexico that is wor and concerned about the Trinity site fallout. And they uh, represent families who were downwind of the explosion, which was north to northeast of the test, uh, up in the, the area just west of Carrizozo, heading up on towards Santa Rosa, Vaughn, up in that area. And uh, the family stories are that uh, there was a number of folks that uh, got cancer and died. The problem is that the government never followed up really with studies uh, of the, uh, the people out there that did experience fallout on their lands. I think it was kind of a head in, in the sand idea that if, it, if we don't acknowledge it, it'll just go away. And uh, there would have been a great opportunity to study people that did receive exposure, see what happens to them, compare them to what happened in uh, Japan and, uh, and compare notes, so to speak. Right now, they're trying to now recreate exposures. The National Cancer Institute has just released a study on uh, cancer rates in people in downwind of Trinity site. And I haven't read it yet. I don't know uh, what they found. And there are other people looking into cancer rates, but you know, it's 75 years later and it's really hard to guesstimate what exposures were. And, uh, and of course, people die of cancer all the time. And to say that your cancer is a result of Trinity site versus some other cause is really hard to do. Uh, so uh, that is a tough nut to crack right now, but there are people looking into it. Anything else? I think we're done, aren't we? I guess if we don't have any more questions, we can wrap things up. Anybody else going one last time for questions? Okay. Well, thank you everybody that's still on for uh, tuning in. What was the final count on people, Dennis? 41, I think was. Right. Okay, that's pretty good. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. For the presentation. All right. That was fantastic. We really enjoyed it. All right. Adios. Well, look, look for an email from us, everyone, about uh, October's meeting. And we will hope to see you here in virtual space once again. Have a good night. Bye-bye.